boring lecture anyway, so. You only have to listen to half of it. You really sell this on this lecture, Dr. I haven't looked at these slides for two years. <laughs> so we're talking about sort of the basics of the BCSC, right? The, the anatomy, physiology, all that good stuff. Uh, let's see. Anatomy of the lens. There's no blood supply or innervation. So it depends on aqueous for nutrient delivery and waste removal. Uh, we know that what it does, reflects light. Uh, some interesting concepts, I guess you look at it with aging, in terms of changes, sometimes there's a myopic shift, sometimes there's a hyperopic shift. Uh, we know it's always increasing in curvature, but the very changes in index of refraction can alter the actual refractive effect of that. Uh, size at birth uh, versus size at adults, so those are sort of Important anatomic considerations if you're a cataract surgeon, just uh, remembering that in adult size, usually about five millimeters thick at most. Uh, so you've got about five millimeters of depth before you're puncturing the posterior capsule with whatever instrument you're using. <laughs> All right, uh, the capsule, elastic membrane type four collagen, uh, just uh, remember it's thinnest posteriorly, two to four microns, pretty impressive how uh, strong it is despite its thin, thin nature there. You can see it's thickest equatorial and centrally about 14 microns. Zonules, uh, microfibrils composed of elastic tissue. Uh, they originate from the non-pigmented epithelium of the ciliary body. Uh, they insert in a continuous fashion in the equatorial region. You can see they insert just a little bit more uh, central anteriorly versus posteriorly. And with age, of course, the fibers regress. Uh, the equatorial fibers will regress, leaving mostly just anterior and posterior fibers. Uh, the lens epithelium is a single layer. Of course, there's active replication in the anterior equatorial region, as we all know. Um, the newly formed cells, as we know, they migrate equatorially and posteriorly, forming new lens fibers, losing their organelles uh, through that process. And of course, because they have no organelles, they depend on glycolysis. Uh, which, you know, if you remember that from your chemistry, biochemistry class. Uh, let's see. So uh, those highlights here, of course, no cells are lost from the lens. The oldest uh, form the uh, nucleus, so you'll see that fetal or embryonic suture pattern. And newest form the outermost aspect of the, you know, the cortex. Uh, you've seen the lens sutures on those who have looked on slit lamp exam, the interdigitations there, the apical and basal cells. Um, we see optical zones when you look at uh, a lens. Uh, so you might notice that there's sort of this delineation of an endonucleus, the central lens component versus uh, the epinucleus or cortical material. Uh, when you look at cataracts, sort of a similar finding, except it's not a clear lens, obviously. It's a, a clouded to some degree. There's no morphologic distinction between the cortex and nucleus, though you know, we have these surgical delineations that we talk about or discuss when you actually look at it from uh, a uh, pathology assessment, histologically, uh, there's, there's really no differentiation. The, the lens epithelial cells, uh, those, those lens cells look the same. Uh, let's see, crystalline proteins that make up a lot of what is left over once the lens has uh, uh, eliminated its organelles. You can see uh, some fascinating concepts about it, and uh, maybe you should read about this sometime. <laughs> it's not, not super exciting. Um, as that, I know as you age, you start to lose some of the, uh, let's see, it says here, maybe it's the next slide here. Yeah, never mind. Uh, membrane structural proteins and cytoskeletal proteins. Is there anything to highlight that I could take off of here while you're reading it? Not really. Here it is. Yeah, the increase of water and soluble proteins with age. This is actually, uh, you know, important to understand as we get older. Uh, protein aggregates into large particles that become water insoluble. That's going to result in opacity, clar reduced clarity, or cataract. Uh, so scatter, they scatter light. Of course, a certain amount of this process appears to be normal with maturation of lens cells. The seen in clear lenses, but the excess of it uh, results in the uh, cataract formation that we see with age. Um, and there's a reasonably good correlation between the amount of insoluble protein uh, and brunescence of a cataract uh, loss of re the reduced form of glutathione, so you get oxidative stress, we get disulfide bonds, uh, pigment formation, cross-linking, etc. So result, results in cataract. So let's see, carbohydrate metabolism. We talked about it requiring uh, glycolysis. 
because it is essentially anaerobic. There's no blood supply. Um, uh, for those of you who remember what ATP is, uh, there's only two produced with glycolysis versus 38 in the Krebs cycle. Uh, so, again, very inefficient. Um, let's see. Uh, this isn't working. There it is. So the lens can remain transparent without oxygen in experimental models, but it uh, cannot remain transparent without glucose, even with oxygen present. So glucose is a very important component uh, to the uh, transparency and functionality of the lens in terms of producing the energy that it needs, the ATP that it needs. Um, we're all familiar. I think this is going to go over yeah, diabetic. Here we go. Uh, what happens with a diabetic? Uh, so aldose reductase is a key enzyme in the pathway of uh, processing glucose. Uh, so there's always a small amount of, of glucose that goes through this uh, enzyme. But if we get a high amount of sorbitol in the setting of high glucose, glucose is poorly permeable, so it will result in the imbibing of uh, water into the lens, which can cause the classic myopic shift that you'll see in diabetics who are poorly controlled. Uh, although I've seen several with hyperopic shifts, so it doesn't always end up myopic, but that's sort of the classic, if you see it on the OCAPs, that's probably the, the answer that would be to that question. Uh, so again, osmotic pressure drawing that, that water in as that sorbitol builds up. So there are different protective mechanisms that you can read about more in terms of preventing oxidation, uh, you know, all of these different uh, systems that are used to help with that uh, vitamin C uh, part of that. So a vitamin C deficient patient, greater risk of cataract formation. Also the level of oxygen with hyperbaric therapy or vitrectomy, so the, the mechanism between, uh, or one of the mechanisms that are thought to be behind a vitrectomy-induced cataract is this oxidative stress. Uh, we remove the vitreous, it causes increased oxygen tension around the lens and increases the rate of that cataract formation, particularly in patients who are over 50. Uh, so when you're talking to patients who are considering a vitrectomy, if they're over 50, the risk of cataract formation with a vitrectomy is much higher than, than somebody who's under 50. Uh, let's see, lens physiology. Mm, accommodation. So we have several different theories about accommodation. I think most of us are familiar with the Hemholtz, which is sort of the classically accepted uh, theory of accommodation. The ciliary body contracts, decrease the diameter of the ring, ciliary ring, the zonular tension decreasing lens increases in circle curve or shape, particularly centrally, that central anterior lens, the greatest change. Um, and it's thought that that change is greater there because of the relatively thinner anterior capsule centrally versus equatorially. Um, uh, the loss of accommodation with age, so an adolescent has 12 to 16 diopters, adult age 40, so somebody about my age, 48 diopters, after age 50 it's less than two diopters. And the thought behind this is that the hardening of the lens is the principal cause of uh, presbyopia, or the loss of the ability to accommodate, uh, just it increases in terms of uh, hardening over a th thousand fold over a lifetime. Other possible contributing factors include uh, the lens dimension changes relative to the ciliary ring. So as that lens gets larger, you lose a little bit uh, of your functional uh, ability to accommodate as well. Loss of capsule elasticity, uh, the geometry of the zonular attachments, the loss of the equatorial fibers with age. Those are thought to contribute as well. Uh, the embryology. 25 days, optic vesicles. This isn't super exciting, but you should probably be at least familiar with, in terms of embryology, uh, the different ocular structures, when they develop and when things can go wrong and how that uh, results in uh, abnormalities. But I won't spend a lot of time. I'll send this, these slides to anybody that wants them. It's essentially a notes of the BCSC series, this whole lecture. Let's look at, so let's look at some anomalies or abnormalities. Congenital aphakia, very rare, uh, primary and secondary, so either the lens placo fails to form or is resorbed. Uh, usually you're going to see other ocular abnormalities, a lot of things developing at that moment. Uh, lenticonus and lenticlobus. Lenticonus, of course, is a focal cone-shaped deformation anteriorly or posteriorly, but uh, 
Uh, posterior is more common. It's usually unilateral and axial, whereas anterior is often bilateral and associated with Alport syndrome. Uh, it's a, not an uncommon pimp question in the cornea clinic, uh, particularly if they come across it. Uh, let's see. Uh, with retinoscopy, you can see this distorted reflex centrally. A uh, red re reflex might show sort of an oil droplet-like appearance because of the difference in the way it's refracting light. And the bulging may progress. You may get an initial myopic shift and eventually maybe a focal opacity in that area as they get older. Uh, it's Mittendorf dot. This is something that you will commonly see on slit lamp exam, uh, just a little spot uh, just off center on the posterior surface of the capsule. It's usually infranasal. Uh, it's just the remnant of the tunica vasculosa lensis. Uh, lens coloboma, there are two types, primary and secondary. Um, these are going to be associated. This primary one is associated as just an isolated finding. Secondary, you're going to see an associated ciliary body zonular defect. Um, they're usually inferior and they're usually associated with a uveal coloboma, so an iris coloboma, maybe a choroidal as well. Um, and it's important from a surgical planning standpoint to know that you're missing zonules in that area. Uh, usually it's going to be at least a clock hour more than what you think when you're looking at it from an exam standpoint. Uh, Peter's anomaly. This is an OCAP test I had, the PAC-6 gene being knocked out in association with this. Uh, it's a spectrum of disorders known as anterior segment dysgenesis. You get the central paracentral corneal opacity or leucoma. And there's thinning or absence of decimase membrane. Um, it's typically thought to be associated with failed separation of the lens vesicle from the surface ectoderm. Uh, possible other findings that you might see, lens findings. There can be adhesion between the lens and cornea. Uh, we can see uh, anterior cortical or polar cataract changes or a misshapen lens that's displaced anteriorly uh, into the pupil or even into the anterior chamber. Uh, and uh, of course, microspherophakia uh, is sort of a classic finding if you don't see some of these other lens findings with Peter's anomaly, that corneal opacity. Uh, microspherophakia is just a small lens with a small diameter, it's more spherical in shape. Uh, usually with dilation, you see the full lens equator and the lens, because of its shape, will result in a myop myopic error because you have a steeper curvature. Um, it's most commonly seen in real Marchesani syndrome. Um, as of course, we talked about the Peters anomaly. Sometimes it's seen in Alport's Lowe's and Marfan's congenital rubella. The biggest thing to understand with microspherophake here is spherical lens is there's greater risk of pupil block, angle closure, uh, and myotics will aggravate this because they cause forward lens movement with relaxation excuse me, not with, with relaxation, with contraction of the ciliary body. Uh, cycloplegia is sort of a preferred treatment uh, in trying to manage this, which is a little bit unusual, um, just because it increases the tensile force on the zonules. Uh, of course, an LPI is the ultimate treatment uh, for this form of angle closure. Uh, aniridia, again, another associate, uh, disorder that's associated with Pax gene um, allele loss or uh, issues with that specific gene. Uh, it's usually a panocular syndrome, but the most striking feature, of course, is the near absence of the iris. Associated findings, corneal panis and epitheliopathy. Uh, you will see an association with aniridia with, uh, I believe, endothelial dysfunction as well. Uh, glaucoma can be associated with that uh, due to uh, abnormality in terms of the develop developmental uh, anomalies associated with the uh, trabecular meshwork structures. Uh, sometimes we'll see optic nerve hypoplasia and nystagmus due to the poor visual potential. It's almost always bilateral. You can see two-third cases, from only one-third uh, sporadic. Sporadic cases often seen with a Wagner complex. Um, you can see cataract changes. You see focal polar opacities. With, and cataracts very common within the first two decades of life. Congenital cataracts, um, by definition, is present at birth within the first year of life. Uh, will occur in approximately one in 2,000 live births. Uh, you can kind of use this basic third of them are syndrome related, of them, a third of them are isolated, inherited, and a third of them are uh, unknown cause if we do a workup. Uh, table 3.1 in the BCSE series has a list of different potential causes. Uh, a lamellar or zonular cataract is the most common type of congenital opacity. 
Uh, a lot of these are uh, bilateral, symmetric. Um, anything else I review with that? Uh, so polar cataract is just a, a focal opacity of the subcapsular cortex or capsule anteriorly or posteriorly. Uh, anterior is typically small, bilateral, uh, not, typically you, not typically visually significant, um, and it, usually it doesn't require surgery, but sometimes it can cause anisometropia, so you've got to be uh, aware of that, looking for that, uh, because of course that can be associated with the development of amblyopia. Posterior is more commonly visually significant because it's closer to the nodal point of the eye, so it's, it's an optics concept. Uh, we all, I think, are familiar with the association with capsular fragility, so greater risk of posterior capsular, either a defect or what is thought to be just fragility, where it's a greater risk of posterior capsular break with cataract surgery in the setting of a true posterior, posterior polar cataract. Let's see, a few other different types. Cerulean, this is one that I'll see every so often, a couple times a year, is sort of these small bluish opacities in the lens cortex. They're not progressive, not typically visually symptomatic, but pretty impressive in terms of the exam features. Uh, let's see. So ectopia lentis, let's talk about this here. Um, so that you can, this can be a congenital issue, developmental issue, can be acquired, of course, from trauma. Uh, subluxated means there's a partially displacement, but you can still see the lens within the pupil. Luxated or dislocated is completely displaced from the pupil, which implies a loss of all zonular support. Uh, obviously, symptoms will include decreased vision. We'll see marked astigmatism due to the uh, displacement of the lens, monocular diplopia, iridinesis. Uh, complications include cataract, uh, displacement of the lens into the AC or vitreous. If in the AC, of course, we can get pupil block and a, acute angle closure. Uh, so acquired, obviously, as we talked about trauma. Uh, these are associated with, this ectopia lentis can be associated with Marfan syndrome, uh, homocystinuria, and iridia, like we talked about. There's Danlos, hyperlysinemia, sulfide oxidase deficiency. Um, and it can be inherited as an isolated anomaly in an autosomal dominant uh, inheritance pattern. But important to know some of these associations more, more commonly Marfan's. Um, just be aware of the uh, different associations with these systemic syndromes and where the lens is more likely to be displaced. Um, with Marfan's, so Marfan's autosomal dominant inheritance, about, although 15% will have patients with Marfan's will have no family history. Uh, of course, the mutation of the fibrillin gene. These patients, we know they're tall, they have arachnidactyly, chest wall deformities, uh, aortic root dilation and uh, malformations are common. Mitral valve prolapse also a big issue. These patients are at increased risk for sudden cardiac events. Uh, let's see, about 50 to 80% of patients with Marfan syndrome will show ectopia lentis, uh, usually symmetric or superior and temporal displacement of the lens. The zonules will remain intact but are stretched, elongated. Uh, when you're looking at a patient with um, lens subluxation, is there any way to tell whether the zonules uh, are stronger in one area versus another? Anybody know what the lens would look like in that scenario? So let's say the lens is displaced in one direction and it's misshapen where it's not completely spherical. One area looks like a little bit flatter. Uh, if you see that, that would suggest the zonules on that side uh, are a little bit stronger. That's what's creating that misshape and the greater tensile strength on the one side versus the other. Whereas if they're complete, if the lens is completely spherical, even though it's displaced, that would suggest the zonules are weak throughout. So that's just a physical finding that you might see uh, that would suggest the zonules may be a little bit stronger, at least in some areas, with one scenario versus another. So just something to be aware of. Um, with Marfan's, has anybody seen a Marfan's patient that didn't have ectopia lentis? I've seen one. I don't see, I don't see a lot of, we don't see a lot of Marfan's, Marfan's patients, but see enough of them that we see this uh, not on, infrequently, particularly if you work with Alan Crandall, you'll see, see those, uh, these are referred to him directly. Uh, of course, other eye findings, they're myopic, there's increased risk of retinal detachment, uh, minor increase in the risk of glaucoma, Amblyopia is of concern because of the high amotropia that they often have. Uh, they will often have weak or absent accommodation at younger ages, so if they're complaining about near vision uh, symptoms, uh, don't hesitate to put them in a bifocal. Uh, 
Uh, lensectomy is associated with increased risk of vitreous loss and retinal detachment, so always there's this balance of uh, deciding uh, when to do surgery in terms of the impact on vision and the risks associated with surgery. Uh, homocystinuria, we won't worry about that. Hyperlysinemia. So genetic contribution to age-related cataracts. So we look at identical and fraternal twin studies that suggest there's at least a, a component of age-related uh, or a heritable component of age-related cataract. So, uh, the BCSE series suggests that 50% of cortical cataract risk is genetic or heritable. Uh, you see this mutation as gene EPHA2. Um, you familiar with that, Nico? You ever heard of that one? No? Okay. Neither have I, other than when I've typed this. <laughs> uh, 35, 50% of nuclear cataract is thought to be heritable as well. Um, so which suggests that study of genetic links and underlying biologic pathways may be important to assisting us in understanding potential targets for therapy. Uh, this is not good for business, so I don't want any of you to spend any time looking for this. <laughs> uh, let's see, ectopia lentis at pupillae. This is an autosomal receptor. We talked about isolated ectopia lentis being an autosomal dominantly inherited uh, condition. If you see uh, ectopia lentis with pupil abnormalities, this is auto typically autosomal recessive. Uh, the lens and pupil are displaced in opposite directions. The pupil is irregular and slit-shaped. Uh, this is typically bilateral, but it can be asymmetric. Pupil uh, will be poorly dilated. Associated ocular anomalies, you can see, again, sometimes associated with axial myopia, retinal detachment, of course, in association with that, and large corneal diameter cataract and transillumination defects of the iris. Uh, persistent v fetal vasculature, PFV, or Persistent hyperplastic primary vitreous PHPV is congenital and non-hereditary. It's usually unilateral. We'll see this white fibrous retrolental tissue, and often with posterior cortical opacification. Cataract progression is very common in these patients, and they, of course, have associated ocular anomalies, elong elongated slurry processes, prominent radial iris vessels, and persistent hyaloid artery. Um, they usually have a fairly poor visual prognosis, though the extent of the changes can be quite varied and, and that will uh, have an impact on their visual potential, how you assess that. So let's talk, let's see, we've got a few minutes left, right? Yeah. Age-related cataract changes. So with age, of course, we know the lens increases mass thickness. There's a decrease in accommodative power. With new layers of cortex, of course, the central lens is compressed and hardens. We get nuclear sclerosis, uh, chemical changes that we've talked about before, uh, and issues with uh, Processing of these crystallines will result in these high molecular mass uh, protein aggregates. Um, they can become large enough to cause local abrupt changes in the index of refraction and result in focal light scattering and reduced transparency. Uh, it's always interesting to me uh, how different cataract, the appearance may not look all that, that much different, but uh, the impact uh, on vision for some patients is much greater than others, and probably a lot of that has to do with uh, these focal areas these sudden changes or abrupt changes in index refraction, uh, which results in greater amounts of light scattering. Sometimes it'll be impressive. When you look at a cataract and you think, there's just nothing impressive about this, you go through the entire workup looking for something else to cause the vision changes, and it all ends up coming back to the very mild cataract that you're seeing. So again, this, this can have a significant role uh, in visual function. Of course, we, we are all familiar with the chemi chemical modifications of nuclear proteins, what it looks like on exam, you know, yellowish going to brown eventually. Uh, decrease in potassium and glutathione, uh, increase in sodium and calcium in terms of cell cytoplasm. I saw that on a, an OCAPS many years ago, that question. Uh, so nuclear cataracts, we know there's some level of sclerosis, uh, which is normal after the age of 50. Um, it's a central opacity. We evaluated the slit lamp. You can sometimes see it with the red reflex uh, when you're looking with a direct ophthalmoscope. Uh, usually it's very slowly progressive, typically bilateral, though it can be asymmetric. Uh, its greatest impact when you're looking at nuclear cataracts, distance vision, usually they see fairly well up close, particularly if they've had a myopic shift, the second sight. Um, there's a reduced color discrimination. I think we're all familiar talking to post-op patients, talking about how they're uh, color perception has improved significantly. They didn't realize the impact. Uh, this is particularly prominent at the blue end of the spectrum, shorter wavelengths. Um, histologically, it's not much different than a clear lens. I'm not sure that's really important, but it's there. <laughs>
So cortical cataracts, you get local disruption of cell structure, of mature lens fibers. Uh, usually this is an issue with the membrane integrity being compromised. Uh, so you we lose the essential metabolites, we get oxidation and precipitation. Uh, it's usually bilateral, but it's often asymmetric, as we know. Uh, the effect on vision depends on the location, so they're just peripheral cortical spokes. You're not seeing a lot of impact on vision. Uh, but of course, glare is a common symptom from focal light sources when we see significant cortical changes. Um, progression with these is a little less predictable. Some are very stable, as we know, when we see them year over year, just the same minor cortical changes. In other, other cases, they can be fairly rapidly progressive. Uh, your first findings, vacuoles in the lens, uh, water clefts, uh, and then of course spokes, these wedge-shaped opacities. Uh, we know with complete cortical opacification, it's mature. Uh, the cortex can take up water, causing swellings, so intumescence. I usually think of intumescence, uh, younger patients with white cataracts, they're intumescent until proven otherwise. Very old patients or older patients with white cataracts, that's usually going to be a rock and not necessarily intumescent, just sort of a general rule of thumb uh, on those. Uh, when the degenerated cortex leaks through the capsule, it'll wrinkle and shrink. We call that hypermature. Uh, with further liquefaction of cortex, it allows the nucleus to float freely within the capsule. We call that a Morgagnian cataract. Let's see, posterior subcapsular cataract. Uh, often younger at age of onset, most commonly it's posterior and axial in location. Of course, glare symptoms, poor vision with bright lights or bright lit backgrounds. Uh, light will induce pupil constriction, or constriction, which results in greater potential impact, particularly, particularly if it's centrally located. Uh, and near vision is often more affected, of course, with accommodative, accommodation, the pupil constricts as well. So the, those are usually the, the times that patients are going to complain about that uh, most commonly. So causes, of course, sometimes it's age, trauma, steroid use, inflammation, ionizing radiation, alcoholism, uh, diabetes. Uh, the histology, we get these post posterior migration of lens epithelial cells from the lens equator, uh, followed by aberrant enlargement, swollen cells called wetal or bladder, bladder cells. Uh, PSC and PCO uh, have a lot of overlap in terms of their pathology, how they develop. Uh, let's see, we talked about some drug-induced, we talked about steroids and PSC association. Uh, there are a few other uh, drugs that can cause uh, lens changes, phenothiazines, myotics, let's see. And the odorone is really visually significant. Uh, statins, studies in dogs, showed cataracts with high doses. Human studies have shown a, some modest reduction in cataract formation. Uh, talked about trauma, radiation. Let's see how many more slides there are. I think we talked a little bit about diabetic cataract before, galactosemia. So effects of nutrition, alcohol, and smoking, this is more important to, to adjust. So uh, lower socioeconomic status, education level, poor overall nutrition is associated with age-related cataracts. We talked about vitamin C, some of the antioxidants. Um, though there are conflicting results with those studies, the ARED study showed no difference uh, in terms of vitamin supplementation. Uh, let's see. Lutein and zeaxanthin are the only carotenoids found in the human lens. Interesting trivia question. I think that's about all I can think of with that. Uh, so smoking, uh, tobacco products, or excessive alcohol consumption is associated with cataract uh, and, of course, age-related macular degeneration. So these are important things. Smoking is an independent risk factor for the development of cataract. We all know that uveitis can be associated classically subcapsular cataract. Uh, corticosteroids, vitrectomy, we talked about that uh, and the mechanism behind it. Uh, hyperbaric oxygen, pseudoexfoliation uh, is probably the last thing we're going to touch on. So this is a fibrillar granular material deposited in the eye or other organs. It's a basement membrane-like material. Uh, when we look in the eyes, deposited on the lens, cornea, trabecular meshwork, iris, ciliary process, anterior hyaluronic base, and zonular fibers. Um, you'll see atrophy of the iris at the pupil margin. Uh, pigment deposition on the anterior iris, they, they often poorly dilate, increased pigmentation you'll see in the trabecular meshwork, uh, on gonioscopy, capsular fragility is a concern, zonular weakness is a concern, um, both with cataract surgery and of course long term, possible spontaneous lens subluxation with a, uh, with a pseudophagic state, uh, open angle glaucoma 
in association with that. It can be unilateral or bilateral on exam or presentation, though it's always presumed to be bilateral. Uh, and it's more apparent, of course, with increasing age. So uh, it's an important thing to look for when you're signing up cataract patients. Uh, and we know we, we do that consistently at the VA uh, just to warn the surgeons about uh, you know, potential uh, increased risk of these different issues, poor pupil dilations, eye or weakness. All right. Does anybody have any questions?